it's all coming. Yeah, right. It's all coming. I got them ribbons. Very red.
to this amazing person, and you have for a while, who connect us all today from DC via lots of different video meetings, emails, phone calls, and text messages. And now here, she's here with us today. Let's welcome Jay Hoshiman. So that Casey just 
Sun, um, who is a Georgia therapy survivor. Thank you so much for being here. Next to Casey, we have Tasha Mitchell, um, also a Georgia therapy survivor, um, also a counselor, and also a pastor, and pastor of discipleship and connection at New Story Chicago. Thank you so much, Tasha. Next to Tasha, we've got um, Pastor Jay, Reverend Jamie Frazier, lead pastor of the Lighthouse Church of Chicago. And then on the end here, we have Laura Faber Diaz, Diaz, um, state rep of um, the Illinois 62nd District. Would y'all help me in on them? Um, okay, so we're going to jump right in. Um, all of you connect to this issue in some way or another. Casey, you are a survivor. Um, you grew up in a conservative area, blue collar town, lots of hyper masculinity. Um, it was very clear to you just through the culture that being gay wasn't okay. Um, and in high school, you started attending a youth group with friends, accepted Jesus, um, fell in love with God, and, and, and wanted so desperately to not be gay because everything around you, including the church, was saying that it was bad and simple, right? Um, through a youth leader that you confided in, you found out about Exodus, and you went through um, a, a, another program, an offshoot called Living Waters. Um, and then during college, I think, you moved to Texas and actually went through Living Hope, which is the program that we see profiled in the film. So can you share some about the harm um, that you experienced going through conversion therapy and the impact that it had on you mentally and emotionally? For sure, sure. Uh, Great. Awesome. All right. Uh, yeah, I, in college was when I really probably was in um, conversion therapy. And, you know, it, it was great because I got to be around all these people that were like, going through the same thing I was, and, um, but unwittingly realizing uh, uh, just the harm that was caused by just them telling me that you just need to play football, you need to do these brackets for sports, like silly things, but like, <coughs> you needed to be more masculine, and that was going to fix your problem, and we strive and strive and strive to do these things, and the th thinking God was going to change us. And for me, it was this idea that, like, all of my, all, like, my prayer was always, like, I need to hear you, and I need you to, you to tell me that I'm okay, that I'm doing the right thing. I never got that. And over the years of just not hearing that, and some people believe, and some people got the idea of, like, okay, great, all right, my prayer's not being answered, maybe just, this is not, this is not working, and I'm fine. For me, it was like, well, I'm just not good enough, right? I... I'm just not doing enough, and God is just not um, <clears throat> happy with me. So I, I eventually just literally like left the faith, left the church because I just thought I was no longer good enough for God, and, and He looked at me. So um, unfortunately, like that, my faith didn't survive. Like I, I had to be, like I, I just had to break away. And I, but I needed to belong to something. Like all I wanted to do was belong. And, connect with people, and so I came out, but I still hated myself. I still didn't believe I was good enough, because I, for years, had been told that I wasn't good enough. Um, so that just, like, led me to, alcohol was my first love, and then that led to just, you know, having any guy that would take me and tell me that I was okay. So a lot of sex uh, that eventually turned to meth, um, that, that just took me down and just completely lost myself um, mentally, physically, spiritually. Like I just, you know, it saved my life because I didn't know how else to cope with this feeling of being so horrible. So, yeah. Yeah. It like really stripped you of your of your son and who you are and your faith, which was the thing that was so important to you. Um, but they really used it and weaponized it against you. Yeah, exactly, and I mean, I wanted to be a youth pastor. I went to college to be a youth pastor, and then I went to, to be a volunteer, and I was open and honest with my struggles, and they're like, we should be around kids. And so that, that dream was lost, and then I was like, maybe ministry, and then the little dreams were lost, and so just like, I was just completely lost. Um, 
Tasha, for you, uh, being a pastor and a counselor who sees clients, um, some who are dealing with religious trauma, um, and also in being a survivor of current therapy yourself, um, like Casey, you also went through Living Waters for a time, and you said that even though they didn't approach it as a mental health program, that they were definitely doing mental health harm. Um, can you explain what you mean by that and just kind of your experience? Yeah, so I've been thinking about this all week. And uh, one thing that I keep going back to is, so the program of Living Waters, are you all familiar with Living Waters? Is anybody familiar with Living Waters? Yeah. So I didn't really know a whole lot about it. Um, and so I got into the program. One of the things that I kept coming back to in the program, reading the materials, uh, there's a book. So the, the person who created Living Waters, Andrew Kuiski, um, he had books. And so we had to read the books as a part of Living Waters. And a word that stuck out to me is perversion. He overwhelmingly uses this word. Oh, I'm reading it and I'm like, who are you trying to convince here? Because you're using this a lot. I almost felt like he was trying to convince himself, and I don't know about his training. Um, but using that term and the language that they use, there was just so much destructiveness in that. Um, and so, coming from like a psychotherapy perspective, but then also a counselor or a, a pastor perspective, when I see in these programs, when I see words like perversion and where it really comes from, is this splitting of self. Saying that who you are is inherently flawed. I believe who I am, right? But there's something inherently flawed, and now I have a split sense of self. There's the self that I am and the self that I'm trying to be. And it's interesting, even in like how we look at, um, when we study scripture, right? We look at the language, point and grief, the word that we get spiritual out of, like the sight of the spirit, it's okay. That's where we get psychology from. So even in understanding the language, there's this idea that the psychology of a person, the spirituality of a person, is so intrinsically tied. And what this program is doing is splitting that. And saying that who you are is at odds with who God is calling you to be. And that is psychologically, spiritually harmful. So that's what I kept saying, I mean, in my experiences in Living Waters, reading some of this content, um, and we talked about this, even seeing my own experiences, getting to a place of like, I'm supposed to be healing, I shouldn't be struggling with suicidal ideation. Like this pro program should not be leading me to deeper, darker forms of depression. So now being on the other side, even working as a counselor, like I have clients, most of my clients are queer. And some of them you know, have really strong stories of religious and spiritual trauma. And I see that same splitting. And now it's like, I'm having panic attacks, and I have anxiety and depression, and I don't know where it's coming from, and I'm like, I do. <laughs> I do. And so, like, doing a lot of that, that work, for me, is really bringing that work together and trying to help people undo that splitting and pull the spiritual and the psychological back together. Yeah. Yeah. It's so wild to me, too, that um, oftentimes the people who are proponents of these programs are saying that truly what are the impacts of going through the program, right? The anxiety, the depression, the suicide ideation are because people are gay or trans or whatever. And failing to acknowledge their culpability, right? Because like you said, the damage that is being caused by being in this program is really where that is coming from. It's not because people are just trying to do it. <laughs> who they are and embrace their faith or what happened. Just follow up on that. I, I can never remember a moment in my life where being queer made me depressed. Or it was what I was told about being queer. Yeah. I never remember a moment being like, I'm queer and I want to like, I'm just falling into depression. It was always the messaging that I was told about being queer. Right. Yeah. Um, Pastor Jay, you, not only does this practice you know, not work and obviously cause such devastating and lasting harm. Um, it's also just rooted in bad theology and false theology. Um, and yet, there are folks who consider themselves devout Christians, committed to God, believe in the Bible, who feel like they have to hold firm um, and support like change efforts. Um, for you as a pastor or someone who studied the scriptures that people are often pointing to um, in this conversation, what are some things that you think folks misinterpret um, about the passages or just the overall message of Christ in general? 
When Lighthouse talks about the Bible and homosexuality, often we talk about four grounded questions. The first is, what is the Bible? And I think there are some who would say that the Bible is a science book or it is a manual on human sexuality. I don't believe those things. I think about what UCC pastor Reverend Candace Chibuhayev says, that the Bible reflects human beings' every evolving understanding of the holy and work of the world. For me, the Bible is a story about covenant, about relationship, about people journeying to learn more and build deeper relationship with God in highly contextualized moments. A second question that I invite our congregation to wrestle with is, what is the gospel? You know, if I asked you to pick up a book and read from the third chapter, fifth sentence, would you be able to interpret the entire book? No, because you would need the entire context. You need the big picture. So what's the big picture? What are the blue notes, the grounding concepts of Scripture? Liberation of the oppressed, inclusion of the outsider, and love, love of God, love of self, and love of neighbor. So when we look at any passage of Scripture in the Bible that does not support liberation, inclusion, and love, we say in that passage that that is a history lesson that is not a transcendent or timeless truth. A third question that I invite folks to ask is, what's the context? Whenever we go to any passage of scripture, whenever we go to any book or writing for that matter, we should ask ourselves, who wrote it? When did they write it? Those five W's we learned in school. You know, who wrote it? When did they write it? Why did they write it? Uh, and, and how were they writing it? And it's important, I talk to my congregation about being high context readers, because scripture was written at a time in which there was no conceptualization of homosexuality as a way that someone is born or hardwired. It was written at a time in which folks thought everybody was straight. But hey, they also thought that the world was flat and living with property and saying it was okay. We live and we learn and we grow. And so in the same way that we have progressed on the rights of women, although seemingly we haven't made that much progress, the same way we have progressed in our theology around slavery, around race and culture, we also have to progress on sexuality and gender. Then the last question we think about as a congregation is what's the benefit? If, who gets to determine what is deemed orthodox in the academy or traditional of the church? Who benefits from homophobic theoretical frameworks? Audre Lorde would argue the mythic norm. The white, thin, male, well-educated, heterosexual man benefits from and so to the extent that many of us differ from that, we should interrogate who we're getting these toxic death dealing theologies from, and then how we are internalizing and spitting that back out to other people, as well as embodying it to our own natural. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Tasha, both when I'm having to do the, the double hat thing of a pastor and uh, as well as a practitioner. Because um, I'm, you know, what you said about that stripping of, of the sense of self, it's happening in regardless of the form uh, that conversion therapy is happening, right? We see one specific form here with the, this very, like, you know, official group. We also know that there are folks who wake up in their, you know, grandma has called their clergy person to pray over them, you know, in their living room. There's lots of different ways that people in power and press upon us that our sexuality, our gender, identity, orientation needs to shift. And yet the through line is that that sense of self continues to be stripped away and the shame is glad and all people feel independent of themselves in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. Um, so given that you are both in the mental health field, also a pastor, what connections Kind of draw between the disciplines of psychology and religion and spirituality as it pertains to conversion Yeah, well, one of the things I was like, me and Pastor Jay are we're friends and we're part of this college ministry, and so sometimes I come over and speak at White House. And a couple months ago, about six months ago, um, I spoke there and I talked about, I took it all the way back to the garden. Sometimes people think when you're progressive, you just throw scripture out, and I'm like, oh no, 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 we do scripture probably like y'all do. Uh, we probably know it a little bit better. I know so many people who are queer who have an end of <laughs> And I know a lot of shy people who have never read the Bible. Mm -hmm. So I go back in this particular sermon and I take it all the way back to the 
garden. I'm like, no, we're gonna get real scriptural here. So when I go back to the garden, what I see are two sins committed. The first sin is actually the deception, right? The serpent deceives the human into believing that who they are is inherently flawed. That's what they do in the garden, right? They tell them that, oh, God has kept something from you, and that who you are, you need to change that. So you need to eat this fruit to make you something different. And then the second act of sin is actually living into that. So what I would say is these first and second acts of sin are deception, and then believing and not acting out of that and saying, I am not created in the of it. I am inherently flawed, and now I need to do something to change that. And so perhaps sin in its original form is actually us rejecting who God has created us to be. And the sin is actually to turn into programs like this and say, I am inherently flawed and I need to be fixed. And God goes back to the garden and says, who told you you were naked? Nakedness was morally neutral in the Garden of Eden, but after this deception, after this sin, now all of a sudden the nakedness has morality attached to it. And so I think about that like that is that splitting of self, right? So putting those in conversation with each other. Who told you you were naked is literally when we start saying that, that tearing. Now I recognize my nakedness and I see it as bad, and God was like, did I ever say it's bad? And we are living, or we have lived amongst us that through this, where we have been told our nakedness, who we were created to be, how God made us in the image of God, is inherently bad. And so that's where I go back to life. I'm like, oh no, let's take all the way back to the garden. You want to talk about scripture? We can do this. We can go back to the garden and actually see what's going on here. So for me, it's get, getting people back, undoing that, that idea of nakedness, right? Recognizing our nakedness, who we were is created in the image of God, and that's a beautiful thing, and to reject that is perhaps the sin. And the folks who are, are perpetuating that, who are causing folks to question and doubt and reject who they are, there is a lot of deception that we see here, right? And we know that for conversion therapy, a lot of young folks are subjected to it. They don't have a lot of power in that situation to you know, to, to change, to, to reject what their, their parents or the adult people in their lives are saying. And even as we get older, you know, college students, young adults, whatever, so much of this becomes this power dynamic where folks are telling you that, you know, not only does your belonging and its community hang in balance, but your soul does as well. And so what options, you know, people feel like they don't have many options in that case. So, yeah. Thanks for that. Let's come to State Rep. Laura. Um, Illinois is one of the 20 plus states and territories that does actually have a ban that prevents licensed therapists from working with uh, minors, right, in this way. Um, and that was passed in 2017 here in Illinois and brought forth through State Rep. Helen Cassidy. Um, but as we see in the film and have heard from our panelists that CT is mostly happening in religious spaces that are protected because of religious freedom laws. Um, so the protective movement is good and necessary, but it doesn't stop it completely. Um, you are working on an additional ban right now um, connected to this issue that has recently passed in the House. Um, we'll be going through the Senate soon. Can you tell us about the bill and what inspired you to work on this issue specifically? <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, Rep. Kelly Cassidy did pass the uh, Youth Mental Health Protection Act, which, um, in 2017. Um, and so we do have a ban, um, but it's only limited to licensed medical um, health care providers, so psychologists, LCSWs. So I uh, really learned more about conversion therapy um, from my friend Jordan, who is here, uh, in the audience when I heard him share his story um, several years ago um, at a PFLAG meeting that we were at, and shared his experience of um, horrific abuse and trauma um, undergoing conversion therapy. And so when I ran for state representative, we decided to work together. And the bill is, um, number is HB 2572, if you want to uh, attract uh, bills and so what it's used to 25 HB uh -huh. 2572. Okay. Um, and this is Jordan's grandchild um, and he works in development so it's a really unique perspective to try to chip away at how conversion therapy happens um, in religious organizations and so it is a bill that proposes 
that state funds should cannot go to organizations who use it expressly for the purpose of conversion therapy. Um, as has been highlighted here, we really have to tackle from a policy perspective. We have to tackle um, preventing this harm that is caused on youth and all people um, from a variety of angles. So looking at state funding, which is where I can, where I can have impact, where it can go, and how we can prevent it from being used um, in this harmful way is one step. And um, so it did pass the House a month ago. It's ready to go uh, in the Senate. The Senate, the Illinois Senate, tends to be a little more conservative. Um, so we will see how that plays out there. Um, but if you're interested in advocating uh, for that and a variety of other bills, we can, we can talk about that later. Um, but this is just one step. <coughs> There's still a long staircase um, that I think that we can and should be able to tackle through policy um, when it comes to working there. Nice. And is there, what's next for the bill? How do people be a part of supporting it? Yeah, so it passed the House um, straight down party lines. Um, in the Senate, there is a Democratic majority, uh, but uh, we still may need to do some pushing. Uh, you can follow that bill, um, any, and in any and all bills on the um, ilga.gov is what we call it, the Illinois General Assembly, it's ILGA.gov. And you find the bill numbers, so you search and you can track them. So currently it's over in the Senate. My senator, um, Mary Ellie Allen, is um, a strong LGBTQ ally um, and is carrying it in the Senate. And then um, we have five weeks to pass it. Um, session ends in Illinois May 19th, and then we get it passed and it'll go uh, to the governor to sign. Okay. That's a tangible step that people can do right away. Absolutely. Contact your, sen contact your senators, find out who your senators are, um, and encourage them to have this bill called, pass it out of committee, and then pass it on the floor. Wonderful. Just for anyone on the panel, we're seeing so many um, anti lgbtq um, attacks on um, these bills come and be proposed throughout the country right now. And um, I'm wondering if there's any connection you would draw to this bad theology of, of conversion therapy in connection with what we're seeing play out right now. I immediately go to the intellectual labor of a black woman, Professor Cheryl Anderson, and her book, The Need for Inclusive Biblical Interpretation. She juxtaposes an openness <laughs> to how we encounter scripture with an openness to how we encounter the Constitution. It's really interesting. In the last chapter of her book, she talks about how the greatest hope in the Constitution is not its original authorial intent, but rather it's the Bill of Rights. It is this trajectory, this bending towards justice and liberation and inclusion and wholeness. And I think very similarly with Scripture. We know we're getting it right when we're bending towards justice and liberty and wholeness. So the same kinds of closed-minded, backwards theology is very much in line with this kind of closed-minded, backwards political ideology, where people believe that they need to go back to this time that was never that great anyways. Uh, all of that, you know, make the Bible great again. Like, oh, these things are tied together and these communities kind of feed each other. Yeah. I think one of the parts that gets left out of the conversation is folks who sit in the ex movement. Um, it's really easy to kind of avoid these folks or illegitimize their movement. Even as I was watching the film, I connected to so many parts of the film, I didn't even realize it. Um, but what I hear is like, a large swath of people who really want, and this goes back to like psychology, like belonging, they want belonging, they want to be accepted, they want things that are normal, healthy, emotional needs, right? And that, and they're finding it, or in their minds, finding it in that space. And so I have grace and compassion in acknowledging, like, as long as there are people who sit in that space, as long as there is a theology that offers them something, yeah. we're going to keep seeing these things. Right? Because there is a group of people who are saying, like, no, 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 keep pushing for these things. And then you put theology in conversation with that, and it's just going to be a continuous fire. And so part of me also has to sit in this like I said, of like grace and compassion and recognizing like they are people too. They're human beings. Um, 
And just kind of like holding that intention because we don't talk about that a lot. Like there's actual people involved who are pushing for this. We are like, no, come, you know, I wish they could see the other side, like what they were saying in the film. Um, and seeing like the harm and destruction, but because they don't see it that way, as long as they sit in that space and there's a theology that takes them, you will continue to see yeah. the like this. And so my, my response to that is, we still have to keep doing the work. Yeah. But also loving and being compassionate. Um, you know, compassion is not the opposite of like this distancing, this avoidance, this rejection. And I, I mean, I've even done this in my own life and struggled with this. Um, but where do we hold space for folks who pursue the next? You know, a lot of us don't want to talk about that, but they need to be just as much as most of us who are from that world. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about it, coming from the outside now and seeing the film again, and just like it's these power structures that we want to attain to. So, I mean, white supremacist kind of um, patriarchal kind of power structures that are just, it, you know, basically always homophobic and anti trans and all that. So, it's, and so being in those spaces, but we're just thinking back to when I was in it, and just we all wanted to live up to these, we always wanted to have. And you see this in the film and all these later, they all just want to that it was from, from the, the Christian right. Like, that is what we wanted to strive for so badly. And we're just hurt people, hurting people to get, to try to get their, their affirmation, their attention, and their love, their approval. And it just, like, it was never working and it just destroyed so many people because of it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Well, let me ask um, Brett War. You know, the opposition is strong, but the movement clearly is happening to counter the harms of conversion therapy um, and all the attacks that are happening. Uh, what else should we know about the political landscape right now in this area? Um, and what would you say to folks who maybe feel overwhelmed or don't know where to start um, or don't really feel like they can make a difference? Yeah, I think this is um, representative of so many issues. We've made progress in Illinois, and I am biased, but we have a lot to be proud of when it comes to protecting people's rights, but we also have a long, long way to go. Um, in um, Illinois tends to be um, a, a bastion of safeguarding people's rights in the Midwest. We are an island um, surrounded by a lot of states who are, who are going backwards um, and, and fighting to dismantle people's rights. Um, in uh, just one statistic, um, in 2023, we have seen 400 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced in state legislatures across the United States. In that same time frame, in 2022, there were 200. So in one year, we have seen a doubling of anti-LGBTQ uh, bills out outside of Illinois. Um, Illinois, thankfully, in my opinion, uh, due to the party structure currently, um, we are not seeing any of those anti-LGBTQ bills called to the House, to call to either the House or the Senate floor. They're not being called out of committee. Uh, the structure, the power uh, dynamic is such in the Illinois General Assembly that those are sent to committees currently where bills go to death. What we are seeing um, in our Illinois General Assembly is a pushing through of bills that are pro-LGBTQ just like the one that Jordan and I are running. Um, it passed out of committee, it passed the House. There are two other bills that I want to highlight. Um, specifically, one is um, Rep. Kelly Cassidy's bill, who she um, passed the um, Youth Mental Health Protection Act. She is running a bill this year um, to protect people, um, to protect um, gay couples who move to Illinois if Obergefell falls at the federal level. Their marriages, and they were uh, married in a state that um, repeals that, um, their marriage will still be recognized here in the state of Illinois. So continuing to protect, really looking at um, reproductive rights and the, and the Dobbs decision um, as a guiding landscape, how can we use that to protect LGBTQ rights as well? Um, and then that, so that passed the House. Um, it also goes to the Senate, um, and so we will be, we're on a legislative spring break right now, so all the bills that pass in the House, when we get back on Tuesday, will then be run in the Senate, and vice versa. So this is kind of a really unique uh, time. And then the second one um, is HD 1286. Um, it's, we colloquial call it in the uh, chamber, uh, the bathroom bill, and it simply um, allows and permits businesses and establishments 
establishment who want to create multi-stall, multi-occupancy bathrooms as alternate, they now have the state authority to do so. Um, so uh, that bill particularly, um, it has been multi-years in the making. Um, it is out of the House and did not pass um, the House or maybe it didn't pass the Senate last year, but it has been, many of these bills have to be run for multiple years to continue to build coalitions. Um, so those are just three bills um, currently, but like I said, we are lucky there are no <coughs> anti-LGBTQ bills. They have been filed <laughs> in Illinois, but they will not, they have not seen the light of day in committee for months long. Yeah. So it takes everyone continuing to be involved and aware and showing up um, and doing all the things to, to have that continue as the trend, right? And to push forth more protections for our community. So that's so important. Thank you. When we come back to Casey, we'll start wrapping up. Um, two questions for you. Could you share some about just what healing has looked like um, for you and how you were able to find some semblance of faith through all the wreckage? Um, and then what would you want to say to folks, particularly young people who are still um, in the middle of dealing with harm and burden yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was a long road of going up and down. Um, I, well, at the time when I just thought I'd lost my faith, I thought I had to do this all by myself, and I tried to quit drinking. I tried to do drugs, stop doing drugs, um, and I just kept going back to it. And I just, no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't do this alone. Um, and then to the point where I finally got into treatment. Um, I didn't want to go to a 12-step fellowship because I didn't think I had a problem with alcohol and um, it was mostly just drugs. Uh, and I didn't, I couldn't do the God stuff, but I, in those in those rooms, I found these people that like I connected to their story and, um, and it just kept me coming back. Uh, so when I would see the steps, uh, with the word God in it, or even a capital H for him or he, it, it was still so triggering. I was still so angry that that this this, this God was still around. And, and once again, I'm in a space where I'm just I, that it reminds me of him rejecting me. Yeah. Um, but I kept coming back, and for whatever reason, uh, when I come into this room of addicts and alcoholics, and I uh, and we share our stories. Somehow we stay sober, somehow how we get better. And through that continually uh, coming back and, and sharing my story and helping others, um, you know, uh, Ray Brown, Ray Brown uh, in her research uh, defined spirituality as the belief that we're intrinsically connected, that we're all intrinsically connected. Uh, so when I think of spirituality, I think of going to these rooms like somehow uh, when I just put my, my um, my will and my strict over to this to something higher than myself, or sometimes it's a room, sometimes it's just something other than myself, like something happens and I stay sober and life gets better. Um, so that's how I've been able to find my faith. It, it's always going to be continually changing, but I know um, that it is from right now, like I'm connected with all of you, and that, that's enough for that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Tasha, uh, for, for folks who are wanting to have a pathway to start reconnecting with their sense of self, right, and heal, um, there's lots of ways that can happen. Um, given that so much harm has, to survivors specifically, has come through therapeutic aesthetics, do you have any like tools or best practices um, for to suggest as a guide for folks who are kind of looking to pursue a path that is actually safe and healing for them. Yeah, I'd say from the therapeutic side, um, really bed and counseling. One resource I'm on there at Psychology Today is great. In Psychology Today, you can find um, therapists, counselors, um, LCSW, whatever you're looking for. And you can really look at where they're coming from, what their background is, and one of the things I love about that is most of us will offer like a 15 minute consultation all free of charge, right? So really doing that research, like, you know, making sure it's a good fit. One of the things I tell people too is like, your gut is an evolutionary tool that is meant to help protect you. So especially are our guts wrong sometimes? Yes, but like when your gut is telling you something, like pay attention to it, right? So many um, folks really looking at what models they're using, like they talk about that, like modalities um, that they're using, are they affirming, do they work with queer folks? Um, do they have a history of spiritual and religious trauma? Some people are coming from that 
fact that we really want to work with someone who at least understands that, right? So taking the opportunity to really, you know, you don't just have to flip, it's like not a phone, but you flip through and you just pick one and then it's like, okay, I'm going to go with that therapist, right? Like there are opportunities for us to really understand who these therapists are. And I use that platform, so I'm on the other side of it, so I understand, right? And I put all of my information on there. People always can ask me questions. Um, one of the other things I would say is if you're, again, trusting the gut, if you're looking at a ministry, you're looking at a church, there's lots of resources, things like church clarity, gaychurch.org, we're on there. When you're looking for churches, right, try to find open and friendly churches, and if your gut is telling you that something's not right here, maybe trust it, right? If the church doesn't want to talk about it, that'll be red flag for me. Yes, or if all they want to do is say you can call me and talk to you, right. but I don't know that I would really say anything specific or yeah. clear. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Last question, speed round to everyone. Let's start at the end and move this way. Um, just what is one thing that you want the audience to walk away with? Um, I think this afternoon is just such an incredible um, example of how I think good change can happen. You have people who are sharing their stories, you have experts in their field, and then I also think we need change at the policy level. And so it is the, the vehicle was this form of art that raises awareness, it provides conversation, and then what do we do all do in each of our spheres, whatever that looks like, um, to move to move our society forward. And I, and I, I love the Bernie Brown quote that we're all inherently connected. Because moving us forward, we have to be inherently connected. Um, and we have to remember that. And it's just someone who does not sit in rooms like this often. This is very different than the general assembly room. This has been so bucket filling for me and remembering and a reminder of why um, I decided to run and do what I'm doing. Uh, so I, I think the one thing I would uh, just encourage everyone to do is follow um, legislation. I think Illinois has a much more hopeful story than our federal government right now. And I think plugging into Illinois um, your reps, your senators, um, is a way that you can really impact change. It's much closer to you, and there and there is there is good forward movement. So paying attention to bills that you care about, getting involved in organizations. Um, Equality Illinois is having an LGBTQ advocacy day down in Springfield. Although they will be um, meeting with reps and senators to push forward movement on these bills. So getting if, if you're interested in policy, if that's the avenue that you care about, um, getting connected. Um, with your local elected officials um, to, to uh, support them and push uh, the legislation forward. Thank you. With the same spiritual intensity that we were oppressed, we must be liberated. So if I could leave this community with anything, it is that the progressive and religious left, we need to fire on the Holy Ghost. You know, one of the things that I was stunned by is in these oppressive systems, there is such creativity with worship, there's such beauty in singing, there's such intensity with prayer. And often when you go into a progressive space, you ain't got no power. You know, we, we've got, in many ways, I would argue, the truth, we've got healing, we've got holiness, but y'all don't have no joy. And, and how often do we have this wonderful message and people come into our doors and every service is like a funeral? Mm -hmm. now, we must, through our worship, through our spiritual practices, through our singing, through our preaching, be as on fire as the spaces which oppress and strip people of their very God-given humanity. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. If I were to leave folks with one thing, I would say I'd go back to the garden again, um, just reminding people that we all are, we, we all are created in the image of God. We bear the Imago Dei, and because of that, we are inherently valued, we are inherently loved, and we inherently have a place to belong. So if nobody has told you that, you are valued, you are loved, you are the image of God, and because of that, there is a place where you belong. Um, I would... <laughs> uh, I mean, we're, I would assume most of us are pretty progressive in our thoughts, we're very open, and we're, I guess we are, I remember talking about this when we were on the, the planning, and just like, when Shay was like, alright,
right, stop it up. And I'm like, well, we're in a bubble within a bubble. Like, <laughs> we're probably very comfortable, like, just loving ourselves and being free and talking about it. But, like, let's maybe get a little bit more comfortable about being uncomfortable. And, uh, just because, you know, there are people around you that may look like you but have completely different understandings of things. And all you gotta do is have a conversation. All you gotta do is just, just bring it up because. You don't know where they're going back to, the places they're going back to, and it could be a kid just like me, right? Yeah. Anyway, so, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to, to decide whether um, God loved me or not. That was yeah. rich. So, um, yeah, be uh, comfortable <laughs> being uncomfortable, and uh, that was all like, Y'all, would you please Trans action. 
actions, anti-LGBTQ actions generally, those were chilling numbers for representative. Um, and so I came today because I'm seeking what is mine to do from within the evolution of my own healing story. And, I, and I've been thinking this for uh, maybe a year, so thank you for giving me a chance to say it out loud. I have a responsibility. Maybe you don't resonate with this, depending on your journey and gift and call. I have a responsibility to be in the same kinds of Bible and sexuality and gender identity conversations that I was in in the 1980s and the 1990s. Because there are so many people captured by the religious errors um, um, underpinning uh, this film. And, and so I say that out loud. Why did you come? You see, you can't ask the question, what's a powerful call to action, unless you're willing to be personal about it for a couple of minutes before you leave the room. We could put it into the big story of all the reasons we should hate and resent all those people for their foolishness and their bigotry. Or we could put it in the bucket of, why did I come today? And what is mine to do out of my story? More personally, your own spheres, as you said. So think with me about these beginning points, and maybe you have a better idea to add. But of course, many of us may be connected to a church family, perhaps a, a church family that is on paper and in signs, uh, proud to be welcome. Proud to be welcome. I just ask you if you could make an announcement tomorrow in church about the fact that you did this and why you think it's important. What you'd like your siblings there to take on with you. Could you write a newsletter article for the main issue of your church newsletter? Could you make an appointment with your pastor or your peace and justice committee and say, I saw this, it's so important. Others are making films too in this day, it's so important. Pride Month is around the corner. Can we not make a witness? and share these stories. Some of us may be in church settings that aren't formally on the record as being committed to LGBTQ welcome. If you're a part of a community that is, is still living out a uh, supposedly traditional view on these matters, we just charge you to help to open our eyes to the harm. To, to talk about suicide, to talk about what a chaplain friend of mine um, uh, talks about in terms of theology of restraint. Let us not underestimate the life-giving space of being in a space that is perhaps not yet at that stage of development that is formally welcoming and resourcing for us, right? But where people are at least able to offer restraint. To give space to agree to disagree. I know many of my progressive colleagues don't like that, agree to disagree. But space can save lives. Maybe you're not part of an organized uh, spiritual community at this time. Who are the couple of people in your life that would benefit from knowing that you are here today? And what will you say about how it touched you? be different for each of us, perhaps. And then finally, I would just say, um, I appreciate you for making this explicit, Shane, that it's not just organized reparative therapy uh, session strategies, curriculum that are a threat, but the implicit bias that is in the air and in the water. And let us be attentive to naming explicitly the importance of, of addressing that. Before I close, and just to go back to the more personal thing, I know some of you, I know some of you for 30 years, that's awesome. Um, I know we're all on different parts of the spectrum and journey of making sense with the Apostle Paul, or peace with the Apostle Paul. But there are a couple more schools that matter to me for talking about organizing uh, within and against uh, faith communities. Uh, one is 
the whole dichotomy of like coming from a carnal place, ooh, that's a trigger word, I get it. Or a spirit place. This is my testimony as I need my call to action. I want to have a warrior energy that comes from love and devotion and healing and compassion. And not the tribalistic resentment, blowtorch mentality of the day. And so I want to ask you to name what is your style of worry? What is your style of worry? And then secondly, and finally, I would say, there is that disturbing phrase, all things are lawful, but not all things are edifying. And as I claim my own speaking voice in more conservative arenas, right, to call attention to the harm done in the reparative movement, to call attention to the harm done is to say, yes, of course, we have different theological views, ethical views, biblical interpretation views at this moment in history as we're continuing to evolve. And to help the people who are heart-centered, fear-diminished people, to see and to name the harm, the damage, like the millstone hung around them, right? The burden, the necessary burden. These are some morsels of, of uh, personal testimony and call to action. I want to ask you, why did you come today? Who are the people in your sphere? And how are you going to continue unpacking this powerful afternoon for your own healing and good and power and for those around you? Blessed be. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.